Good evening and welcome to Vote 2016 Federal Election Series. They've been going for many weeks. I'm sure some of you have been every single week. Uh, this is my second appearance. I came to the first one, which I really enjoyed, and have come back tonight, where our topic is healthcare. You know, in ongoing surveys from the federal government towards voters in Australia, it is found consistently that health care and economic issues rate as two of the most important issues uh, Australians consider when placing their vote. And there's been a lot spoken about health care in this election, and our three experts from the university today are going to talk about that, but also their own particular ideas, policy ideas, responses in the areas of health care. Uh, the ANU election series is presented in partnership with PolicyForum.net, which is based here at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. PolicyForum.net is the Crawford School's platform for analysis and discussion about the region's public policy challenges. So if you haven't been on PolicyForum.net yet, I do encourage you. There's a lot of information there. The podcast of tonight's panel will be available to listen to shortly and to find that visit the website of ANU at anu.edu.au and click the 2016 Federal Election Series and that will take you to the podcasts. And I invite you tonight to join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag OzVotes and our ANU. Health policy, as we said, is a key election issue, and tonight we're going to hear from our experts. Sharon Friel joined RegNet, which I had to look up because I didn't know what it was, Sharon, but I discovered it's the School of Regulation and Global Governance here at the ANU. And uh, Sharon joined that in May 2014 and became the school's director in July 2014. She also serves as a director of the Menzies Centre for Health and Policy at the ANU. And in our discussions, it was very clear that one of Sharon's great interests is in uh, primary health care and how policy towards primary health care affects actually the health of people and therefore the economy and its broader implications. Uh, she's also the co-founder of the Global Action for Health Equity, health Equity Network and Global Alliance, concerned with research, training, policy and advocacy related to action in the social and environmental determinants of health equity. Associate Professor Adrian Kay in the middle here is Director of the Policy and Governance Program at the Crawford School of Public Policy. His major research interests lie in the intersection of international and comparative public policy with a particular focus on transnational health policy um, and the social determinants of health policy. Art Sardrikian is the Professor and Foundation Chair of the Department of Health Services Research and Policy at the Research School of Population Health and, and has joined the ANU for this role and has brought his international expertise uh, with him to Australia. He holds a professorial uh, chair at Weill Cornell Medical College. He's a trained cardiothoracic surgeon and a graduate of the John Hopkins University with a PhD in Health Policy and Management. Please Please welcome our panel and we're going to start this evening. We'll hear from each speaker briefly and we will have time for questions. So please think about your questions uh, while they're speaking and we will come to you as soon as we can. Sharon, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm not really going to speak about health care as such. I want to make the point that every public policy affects people's health uh, and it the inequalities that we uh, experience in health in Australia uh, can be remedied if we think about a whole range of public policies. But I want to start by saying we've had such significant improvements in health in Australia and that really has been a testament to very good public policy. Uh, we had a fall in about, of about 10% in fatal and non-fatal uh, diseases uh, within uh, less than uh, 10 years, which is no mean feat at all, and that was largely cardiovascular disease. Uh, uh, but we do still have quite a significant burden of disease. If you look at recent data from the uh, AIHW, where the analysis looks at the burden of disease for Australia, so we've still got 4.5 million years lost. 4.5 million years lost 
due to premature death or people living with illness. So we can still do an awful lot. And there's five diseases that dominate uh, our disease burden in Australia. Not a surprise probably for people in the room. Cancers, cardiovascular disease, mental and uh, substance uh, misuse problems, and musculoskeletal, a word that I can never say, so I'm not going to say it again in, the, <laughs> in discussions. Um, these are really quite, well, many of them are very preventable. In fact, the estimates from AIHW is that we can prevent more than a third of the burden of disease addressing uh, these factors. Uh, and the risk factors, so the sort of the behavioral risk factors uh, associated with these diseases are things like uh, poor diet, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol, uh, so the sort of the behavioural risk factors. We've had some attention to those within the, the discussions, the policy discussions uh, in the election campaign, not an awful lot, but I'd like to uh, discuss this evening that actually if we pay attention to the causes of the causes, so the social and the economic factors that affect what it is people eat, what it is people drink, how it is we live our lives, our daily living conditions, we'll actually see quite a significant and very cost-effective approach to health in the country. And the point of the distribution of health, we experience health inequalities in Australia in a way that really is quite disgraceful. Why is it that the poorest 20% of the population can expect to live six years less than the richest 20% of the country? Why is it that Indigenous Australians can expect to die almost 11 years earlier compared to non-Indigenous Australians? That is not a biological thing. There's no reason, no biological reason for these differences. It's preventable. And in discussions around our quality of employment, our access to health care, which we will speak about in terms of the way we design our cities uh, that make them people-centred, that would go a very, very large way to address these health inequities that we have in Australia. So when we have a discussion about health policy, we've got to have a discussion about the broad, broad range of public policies as they affect our health, because actually it's a very cost-effective thing to do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make three points. Um, uh, the first is that system-wide uh, reform, healthcare reform in, in Australia is very difficult. Um, uh, politicians know this. It's difficult for a number of reasons. Um, we have obviously a federal uh, healthcare system in which roles and responsibilities, uh, finances, uh, delivery uh, are split between governments, between the federal, state uh, and other governments. Further, it's a hybrid mixture of public and private sectors, Australia unusually in comparative terms for um, a, a, a country with a universal health insurance system also has a subsidised and heavily regulated private health insurance system. For all these sorts of reasons, there's no real kind of command and control base for the entire Australian healthcare system. Therefore, it's very difficult for whichever Australian government comes in to actually reform and control and direct the system. And this means that, for example, things like controlling costs, uh, managing uh, and assessing the use of new technologies in the system. Very difficult. Australia has a very uh, well-regarded uh, and well-established uh, process for new medicines, uh, for considering uh, new pharmaceutical products, but for other bits of technology in the system, it's much less comprehensive, much less transparent and rational in what it's doing. And that's one example of where, although we talk about the Australian healthcare system, it's, it's not really a, a well-integrated system, and therefore it's difficult to make policy uh, about it. As I said, politicians uh, know this. Um, most, most election campaigns, uh, you don't, even though it's very important uh, and voters put a great deal of priority onto healthcare, you don't see a lot of detailed discussion of healthcare reform. I think the last election where that happened was in 2007, where uh, Kevin Rudd had a clear uh, plan in which he linked together uh, his views for reforming federalism in Australia with his ideas of reforming um, uh, healthcare in Australia. And perhaps uh, the lessons uh, from that period that was ushered in by Rudd's election in, December, in November 2007, perhaps they've been learnt uh, by politicians in the negative, in the sense you try and stay clear of big promises on healthcare and stay clear of commitments on healthcare 
uh, reform because they're difficult to implement at the, from just the Commonwealth Government basis. The final point I'd like to make is that the, the kind of real questions of what, what the health care system is for um, really aren't spoken about. And this really follows on from Sharon's point that the, the health care system really isn't that much about health. It's really about diseases. Um, uh, the major determinants of health are all things that exist in public policy areas outside of the healthcare system. So the uh, determinants of health uh, in terms of uh, tobacco consumption, alcohol consumption, diet, exercise, all these things are really things that have conventionally sat outside the Australian healthcare system. And there seems to be no platform or at least discussion at the moment about how to uh, make sure that prevention is, is actually a central part of health policy. It's much more about uh, health care as, as disease management rather than health promotion. I have the advantage of talking last, so you remember what I said best. Uh, so, um, I, and I'm, I'll, my, I'll build on what Sharon and Adrian were talking about, preventive care, advancing preventive care, uh, better um, organizational aspects of care. I'm a surgeon by training, interventionist, so I will hit on the issue that is relatively under-recognized, which is efficiency of the healthcare, particularly the hospital care. So there, is, there are a number of studies, and these are multinational studies, that show that a healthcare can be at least 30% more efficient if we target surgical interventional complications adverse event of drugs and medical devices and advance the quality of interventional care. So when we talk about cutting costs and how much we invest in a healthcare, I'm less worried about how much money we spend on a healthcare. I'm more worried about if we're getting value for money we spend. So ultimate value for humans and us is the healthcare and, and long life and, and better quality of life. Maybe we don't have to spend that much money on defense, and we can spend a lot more on healthcare as soon as we're getting good value for money with we'll a good, lean healthcare system where the dollars yield the value that we're expecting it to yield. So, in that context, I have three points to make. The three policy issues that I think we should target in a healthcare, and these are international issues, not necessarily. Uh, unique for Australia. So a variation in care, variation in offering technologies and outcomes on a regional level. If people in Sydney will get better care, better outcomes than in the Northern Territories, and if you deem 10 times more money spent per capita, then we need to learn about it and do something about it, because that's about inefficiency of the healthcare. Either in some places, there is lower access to care and health burden is not being addressed or in other places there's more spent and overuse happens. So we need to learn about this and address it in a policy level, research level. Second issue is I think these uh, technologies that are offered within healthcare, primary care, interventional care, if there are a lot of these that are low value, non-evidence based, and we know from the birth of evidence based medicine a lot of things we do in a healthcare might not have a good evidence basis. We need to learn about it and target and cut back on that waste. Low value care, I think, is something we need to, we need to definitely target. Third issue is better choices, informing hospitals and clinicians. There's reference pricing issues, but evidence-based reference pricing for technology purchases so that we can level like and address private healthcare and, and, and um, and non-private healthcare uh, differences in terms of premiums and, 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 and issues related to purchasing and the costs. I think those are the issues that um, are important and also about inefficiency of the healthcare system. So I think evidence-based reference pricing so that purchasing happens on, in a way that can uh, provide better value is a third issue that I would put in this context. Thank you. Well, we'll be going to your questions in a minute, so please, if you've got a question, we've got some microphones around, so please be ready, and uh, 
Before we do that, I should say, uh, my name's Catherine McGrath, and I normally work up in the parliamentary press gallery. So I've been covering the campaign for the several weeks that it has been going on. And if it was a normal campaign, it would be over already. Uh, but it's not over already. And I've said to a number of people, I think if you're a member of the public, it would be a pretty hard campaign to be engaged in or, or excited about. And I think a lot of Australians feel that way. Health is a very, very big issue. The politicians are going to hospitals all the time. And they're not going to hospitals, they're visiting GP clinics because there are a number of issues in play. And I'll get you each just to comment briefly if you could because I think voters would like to hear from you on these issues. Now, one of the... Going back to the 2014 budget when the then Abbott government uh, ripped up the agreement with the states and uh, effectively $57 billion in forward estimates funding was no longer. The government says they didn't pull it out because it wasn't there in the first place. Labor says they did pull it out. But it's been an argument over that funding ever since. So that's at play in this election. Labor announced on the weekend that it would recommit to that agreement between the uh, the federal government and the states and would pay 50% of uh, agreed efficient hospital costs. And it also said it would put $100 million into primary health care. The government has its new health care homes program that it's building on and has also been looking at, at um, health insurance. Now, if we can start with Sharon. Health insurance and uh, GP <coughs> services. How do you think the government, how do you think they currently are for people and what have you seen on offer that you think is worth considering? So I, I wouldn't comment on the health insurance. It's, it's not something, and I'll, I'll pass that over to the colleagues who know much more about it. But in terms of the, the GPs, so the idea of, so the homes idea uh, is actually a really sensible one in terms of having the services easily accessible, uh, easily referable, having the allied health services there connected makes an awful lot of sense for people, particularly uh, with multiple chronic conditions. So that's a sensible uh, policy idea. The, and there's a lot of experience of that uh, internationally and how that can be done well. Um, in terms of the, I suppose I would comment uh, on the fairness, you know, so having a fair go for health and one of the big concerns from the, the GP perspective and certainly the continued, if, if it does continue, the freezing uh, around the rebate uh, for GPs, uh, you know, the ability to bulk bill and what that might mean for GP prices and what that will, if that then flows into um, you know, basically equitable access. We might just bring everyone up to date. You're probably familiar with it. You probably heard it being talked about. But there is a freeze on the GP co uh, the GP rebate, rebate to GPs from the government. And in the last budget, it was extended to 2020. So there is debate around that. Um, yeah. The ALP has said it will unfreeze it. Yes. Um, and so that might. So that's not a direct. Uh, sort of additional payment for users, for us, the people going along to the GPs, uh, but the argument might be that, well, somebody will have to pay for that, that rebate freeze and will it then get pushed through from the GPs uh, onto the patients and ultimately will um, affect uh, lower socioeconomic groups, people with multiple uh, morbidities uh, having to, to go and see the, the GP. So that's, you know, in terms of an equity question within the health care system, that's a real, uh, I think, a real question. Um, and I, I haven't seen a, a real very strong response to that, uh, saying we think from a fairness, a fair go, in, in the Australian context, a fair go for health, that's something that we really need to think about. And then, of course, the, the insurance question comes into to play. Uh, I'll let uh, Adrian answer that. In a minute. There's a question up here, I think. Was there a microphone? Um, sorry, just up the back there. For the uh, last 35 years or so, we've been living in this uh, era of neoliberalism where there's been a push toward privatization of many, many things, including healthcare uh, in Australia, among other countries. Uh, but other than uh, privatized healthcare benefiting the more affluent sectors, is, is that really consistent with the idea of a fair go? Uh, can you have a health equity, social equity, uh, when you have a system which is 
being privatized. And when I think of a privatized healthcare system, the United States of developed countries has the most privatized system in the world. 18% of the US GDP now goes to healthcare. But the health statistics don't bear that out because there is this huge medical industrial complex, uh, which is a big profit making machine. So, so do we need to start talking about reversing the trend toward privatization of health care? Adrian, let's look. Uh, I, I'm not sure in Australia there is uh, such a pronounced trend towards the privatization of health care. Certainly private health insurance in Australia pre-exists, long pre-exists the neoliberal era. Um, the, I mean, I think your equity point is well made, that if you use public funds to subsidize private health insurance, you're, you're favoring a certain, the 40 or so percent of Australians who have private health insurance, and that costs a lot of money as well. Um, uh, the Greens have done the most work on this. They commissioned the Parliamentary Budget Office to cost the, the, the value of the private health insurance rebate, and they, uh, the PBO came up with a figure of $5 billion per annum, $50 billion over 10 years. Uh, that's a substantial amount of money to be subsidising uh, just 40% of the Australian population, and we assume the richest 40% of the Australian population. So I think your point about uh, supporting private health insurance is well made. Whether this, uh, I'm not quite convinced this represents a wider privatisation or Americanisation of the Australian healthcare system. And Art, what do you think <clears throat> I think it's not very efficient system, fee-for-service, and privatisation to the extreme I agree with you, um, in the United States, and I'll, um, I mean, I, I, I'll be guilty, I'm found guilty of, of criticizing the system that I've you know, been working in for 20, almost 20 years. And I'll, I'll tell you that it does lead to inefficiencies and it does encourage interventional care rather than primary care. So every general practice practitioner or any specialist is looking for intervention to do to bill more. And, and I think that's, that's not a good incentive, fee for service and particularly encouraging interventions that often have little value or are low value care. So I think that's a major issue we're facing in the United States and it's possible we'll be facing also in Australia if that's the direction this will be going. So I agree with Sharon, in fact, we need to incentivize more primary care and it, often those interventions in primary care, healthy living, that are not necessarily possible to privatize in a way that are incentivized in a, or in a private healthcare system. Now, I'll just get you to keep that microphone for a minute and I'm gonna ask you a question, but we'll get the next questioner ready uh, with the microphone. Is there a question up here? Yep. And we'll come to that in a minute. Now, while we're getting the microphone over there, you spoke earlier about big data being available in medical decision making. In Australia, what is the problem at the moment in that area? <clears throat> so, uh, the, I mean, I have like only seven months experience. I'm new here. Uh, my, so these are early observations. But, but I have to admit that uh, I was expecting that Australia would have all the resource, all the data is there, and yet access is quite limited. I was expecting it would be much easier for scientists to be able to access national data, MBS, PBS, link it up with the state data and create really wonderful repository of data sources with primary care and hospital care interconnected longitudinal tracking of patients' care over time. So all data exists but unfortunately, little efforts are made to connect, link all that and make available for qualified scientists. And I'm not saying it has to, everyone has to have access on their iPhones to start playing with this or their iPads. But for qualified scientists, access is quite limited. Uh, and so, I mean, again, I don't want to have a comparison with the United States, but in New York State, where I work uh, and worked, and um, I had since 95 to 2014, 20 years of longitudinal records of 27 million people who live in New York, 
and I could track every hospitalization on individual patient level, de-identified, I don't need to know who these people are, but I could track their hospitalizations, outcomes of those hospitalizations as part of the routine care data collection. And I could also look at the um, link it to mortality data. Uh, I could uh, potentially get physician um, unique identification, their license numbers, so I could look at the study on a physician, individual so physician system, outcomes in addition to that. Unfortunately, all that data exists here, but it's not made available and interconnected. What's the benefit for Australian citizens if that was available? I think scientists like people at ANU having access to that data could definitely look for this unwarranted variation, document inefficiencies in a healthcare, look at the real world outcomes of all those 40, 50, 400 items that Medicare is paying for, understand what's low value care, and inform the policy better. So I think those issues, certainly scientists could do well, work with that big, big data, look at the comparative safety effectiveness of many things that are paid for, and also link it up with clinician databases, say, Australian Orthopedic Association has a wonderful registry of all hip and knee replacements done in this country, an internationally well-known, excellent uh, resource. And we could also understand not only just orthopedic aspects, but the disease aspects of care for patients st struggling with osteoarthritis and arthritis, which affects 20% of the uh, population and, and highly prevalent in the elderly. So I think this data access certainly is critical from my perspective and, and ability for us also to compare the outcomes of care longitudinally with other countries' outcomes of care could help us also inform how well we're doing and what are the policy interventions we need to implement to be, do better. Thanks. Again, there's this issue about protecting patients' confidentiality and privacy. We don't need to know who people are. It needs to be de-identified, but made available to scientists. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid I'm a journalist, and so I only engage peripherally in the medical uh, issues. But I thought, having listened to the politicians, that waiting lists was what it was all about. And yet, I've come here, I've heard three brilliant uh, dissections of what needs to be done. Why, why, why isn't this being debated? Why, why aren't we talking about it? Uh, the, these are so important, and as you've said, I mean, uh, Sharon made the point to begin with that, that it doesn't cost a lot, primary health care, um, uh, right through to your point that, that really we need to be doing operations better. I mean, wh where, where are we falling down and why? Well, Adrian, is that stuff? I think because the system's fragmented and, and within this fragmentation, the acute sector, the hospital sector um, dominates. So um, as, as Sharon uh, outlined, you know, the, the rising burden of chronic illness uh, is associated with increasing life expectancy. He's being dealt with too much in an acute sector and not in primary community health care. This is because the system is fragmented and not joined up and part of the questions of big data is it allows us to, to examine those uh, unwarranted variations that occur because of those system boundaries, uh, yet the politics of it gets stuck in terms of the amount of money which is going into hospitals on a 10-year basis uh, and the, the fiscal relationship between the Commonwealth and the states on that basis. But the real system problems um, aren't, aren't being, I think you're quite right, aren't being discussed. Can I, oh sorry, yes. Well, I, I suppose as well, the idea of having um, an announceable uh, around a, a waiting list is an easier thing to say than uh, we're going to address in terms of prevention, the sorts of issues that we've been speaking about, uh, tackling some of these underlying uh, systemic factors. We will see the benefits in 10, 20, 30 years' time. Uh, isn't quite as sexy uh, in terms of as an announceable. Um, it would be fantastic within the media uh, to, I suppose, work uh, with this to, uh, to really help communicate the, import the really profound importance uh, and 
significance uh, and the really very good things that our politicians could be achieving uh, with their mandate of looking out for the Australian population uh, by addressing some of these things. But how how we can how we as scientists um, I mean we're academics, we don't uh, say all of that in a, a very uh, easy way sometimes, but uh, so the communication of these issues through the media, I think, would be something that would be very welcomed, uh, but also for our politicians, you know, the announceables, at, particularly in an election campaign, uh, are so uh, short term. Uh, I agree, um, and the waiting list issue and offering care um, um, say it's it's much clear to a politician when a kid with leukemia was denied care because um, was not eligible for particular technology use or ex expensive drugs, right? I'm just giving you an example from the States. It's probably similar here. It's also very clear someone with arthritis un unable to pay for joint replacement and it's only private insurance system that you will, that, those are kind of more striking and patients get agitated and and reach out to their politicians so it becomes higher on their agenda. And yet I think we have done not as um, good of a job identifying the harms and, and showcasing how we can address the harms and, um, and um, medical errors that lead to um, consequences for health. Uh, a well-known device failures or pharmaceutical failures that harm people, I think they're getting somehow less attention than... So is we, that we, the medical profession, you think, academics? I mean, is it the medical profession? There's been a big case here in the last few years, hip replacements. Hip replacements. Yeah, that's a worldwide problem. Absolutely, and, and it's, it's, it's wonderful government supports that registry, but it constantly asks the question, do we need to keep funding it? Instead, I think we need to ask, how do we fund dozen more of these? and high quality, and if, because they will both improve the quality and efficiency of the health Doctors don't want those things? To, I mean, it's not their natural position to encourage people to discuss different procedures, different uh, technologies available? So the lack of information is certainly a big hindrance. If, if physicians are trained to use a particular type of implant or a device, uh, or they're, in, they're um, familiar with the particular pharmaceutical um, um, and, and prefer these type of medications. I think the information and available for patients, consumers, to make decisions is very limited and it's one-way communication from physicians often. So, and, and uh, having scientists be able to analyze these data and prepare information for patients, having access to this data and link data, I'm going back to my point, I think would certainly help educate patients more and, uh, and help them to make more informed decisions. Not just go and ask for a particular thing they heard on a TV that works best, or uh, agree whatever physician necessarily um, is, is, is telling me is the best, but be, have like dialogue with a physician, be able to pick and choose. Of course, the surgery is a bit more complicated because docs are trained to use a particular implant and to change that decision with technology, we need to have incentives in place. So that reference pricing and also incentives for physicians to change uh, are really important for, Thanks, from sir. policy Thanks, perspective. Thanks, that Question here. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Patrick Tobin, and um, I work for Catholic Health Australia, which represents the Catholic hospitals like Calvary, St Vincent's, and um, so I just thought I'd declare um, interest. Um, congratulations on having this forum. It's obviously one which um, the press club, which many of us would normally expect to go to, doesn't look like it's going to happen this time around, because at least one political party doesn't want health talked about as much. Um, the other thing I was going to say too is in terms of Labor's commitment to um, hospital funding, what they've committed to is 50% of the growth in funding, not 50% of funding. So at the moment the Commonwealth pays about 37% of public hospital funds, so Labor's not going to suddenly jump that up to 50%, but I think that's a common misperception. Um, the question I was going to ask is, um, in terms of health reform, um, obviously governments are important actors, but in this country they're fragmented. We also have private health insurers as well, and against that you've got very powerful um, provider interests um, in terms of 
what you might do with reform. So things like fee for service, to actually address that, you actually will come against the interests of very strong provider groups. Um, data, so for consumers, there's no comparative data about what fees are from one provider to another. You can't get data easily on the actual outcomes of particular procedures. So as a consumer, unless you know somebody in the system, you, um, you're making choices very much based in the dark. So I guess my question is, to what extent can we expect significant reform when you have um, very strong provider interests whose interest often is not to promote reform? Um, I, I don't think we should be expecting major reform uh, soon, um, for all the good reasons you've, you've um, outlined. I mean, fee-for-service is a really good case of where, when health reforms in the 70s were being first considered, you know, it survived um, uh, and uh, at the behest of the medical profession and has become installed and institutionalised as something that is really difficult to shift within the Australian system. However, I think over time, I think changing demography, changing social attitudes, and I think a more enlightened way of using COAG as the way a national uh, health performance agreements, as m there may be some glimmers for real reform in that sort of area. And I point to something like mental health as an example of where new ideas can get into the system, new money can get into the system, and maybe looking there is where we'll see the best opportunities reformed and, and where politicians uh, sticking together can confront some of these provider interests. The, the only other comment I suppose I would add is uh, the power of some of the other, uh, the, the NGOs, the, the not-for-profit uh, particularly NGOs, and if you think of the... Um, the power of a collective voice of, from the, the various uh, disease health alliances, the public health associations, uh, the Health and Hospital Reform um, Association, uh, the Australian Medical Association, having a um, a collective voice uh, from those groups, one would be fantastic, um, but uh, some way of bringing those voices together into this debate uh, around this of the, the private uh, um, or some other uh, vested interests, I think. So the using those other uh, mechanisms to enable those government or politicians and uh, colleagues within the bureaucracy to you really take on some of the, the issues that you're speaking about? So, not directly relevant to your comment, um, but I found talking to my colleagues in multiple, I mean, many universities in the country, they're having way harder time, in fact, accessing private health insurance data. And, and, and they're much more paranoid about making that data available for research. And, and I think with government subsidizing a lot of this, there has to be a bit more transparency. And also it will help us understand if private health insurance is offering better value um, and you know, compare to public system. It's extremely important in my opinion to understand if, it's, it's, if it really improves the, the quality of care and that will inform the debate how much, um, how much uh, privatization uh, we should accept and what's acceptable. Uh, and this is not, again, only Australian problem. When he, we, let's say, you would like to look at the United States Medicare data, which is only over 65 population, but it's a wonderful resource. Again, interconnected data throughout their life uh, after 65. And yet, with the introduction of managed care, which is private health, like private health plans that are managing these Medicare patients, we keep losing data. It's now reaching 30% of Medicare data is lost because the private health insurance is not sharing that information. So in, in, in 10 years, it might be 80% managed by private health plans, and even that resource will disappear. So I really, my play is really from scientific side, let's make sure data is not lost and is available for us. Yep, they get commercially handled and they internally might not be very interested to collaborate and cooperate, so they're not sharing. Unless there is a way, either with carrots and sticks, to incentivize that to happen, I think it's a, it would be horrible for scientists to not have that information. Well, 
Well, also voters probably didn't even know it was a, didn't know it was a thing until just now, Art. So people can now they can you know write to their MPs, they can ask, they can see why that's not happening. Now, uh, going back to that earlier issue of the uh, GP uh, rebates and the advertising campaign, are people aware of the advertising campaign that the Royal Australasian College of General Practitioners are running on television with basically that campaign with heart-rendering stories of people saying, no, I didn't go to the doctor because I couldn't afford it, basically. And they've got big campaigns in GP offices around Australia run by the college the first time they've done it. Now, can I, each of you, what do you think of that kind of campaign? They're, they're out there, they're telling their <coughs> patients to speak to their MP and to activate on this. It's a good thing. Um, we, um, well, we also we know the power of those types of campaigns. Um, we've certainly seen it internationally. We've seen it uh, around things like tobacco. Uh, some of the approaches that we're taking in the, the tobacco campaigns with the AIDS uh, campaign, so quite powerful. Um, and I think, I suppose, what that type of campaign raises is two things. One is you, as a human being and as a voter, you have agency, you have control, and the way you can use that is you go and you speak to your politicians. So it's really quite empowering uh, for, for us listening to those campaigns to be uh, enabled to, to, you know, uh, to do that. Uh, and the second is, and again I come back to the, the fairness argument, it really hits home uh, fairness. And if Australia is really concerned about a fair go, then it speaks to those values. Um, whether that speaks to, there has been some work done, I think it was by the Australia Institute, uh, um, which looked at how that, the fairness values uh, actually was positioned across different generations. It certainly is there among older generations, uh, but not, if I remember it correctly, not so much in some of the younger generations. So whether that works for that, uh, uh, that target group, maybe that's not the target group, I'm, I'm not sure. So you've got an empowering, uh, you know, come, come and be part of uh, making this for you, and it's identifying and tapping into some of the, the fairness values that uh, is uh, strong within Australia. Adrian. Um, uh, on a straightforward political analysis point of view, it's um, interesting. Uh, this is obviously a coalition uh, uh, government, traditionally, um, strongly supported by, by doctors, the very fact that they have to be so public uh, and uh, noisy about their opposition to a government policy is unusual in, 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 and really shows maybe they've lost a little bit of insider status and, and maybe the medical dominance of some of the health policy politics in Australia has, has weakened slightly. So it's, it's interesting both in its noisiness but also what it might tell you about insider power of, 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 of the general practitioners here. Question over here. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. Um, my name's Trish Carl. I'm one of the Greens candidates for the federal election, just being up front there. And I think well, we're not actually having sort of candidates' speeches, so I think at no, the no, minute... No, no, I'm no. I'm not giving no. a speech, I'm just saying who I am, because I'm <laughs> going to comment on the, a really good question about why we're not talking about health issues more. I think that was great, because I can tell you out there in the community, um, health is really the number one issue that people are coming up to me about. And they are saying how wonderful the doctors are at Canberra Hospital and the health professionals in general, but they actually do see that we need to discuss um, resourcing and revenue for our service, health services. So I guess that is my question. Are you able to comment further on how we actually, um, actually say we need to fund these essential services and we don't say screw all over here or something, that it is about funding these services and having that discussion? Thank you. Uh, um, well, we, I mean, we, I suppose I can say we, we have an election coming up, so, so um, uh, the opportunity for voters to, to use this um, uh, last few weeks to try and provoke the politicians into being uh, transparent and clear about those funding commitments and about uh, the differences. And, you know, I'm even as someone who follows health policy, you know, confused by, you know, what is happening beyond the forward estimates and how much uh, both major parties are committed to, to, to funding the growth in hospital costs. And, and that uncertainty feeds through to 
uh, you know, makes, has important effects about decisions, planning decisions, the building of hospitals, uh, the planning of healthcare services, because these operate on much longer lead times than, than just the just the four years of the Ford estimates. Thanks, Adrian. We might just get a couple of questions in a row, so people so there and then here and then at the back and see how we go. This is very quickly one after the other, and then over here. Hi there, Liz Allen from the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research here at the ANU. Uh, my question relates to, um, I guess, the policy landscape with reference to Indigenous health. Um, it's been increasingly suggested that uh, addressing Indigenous, um, uh, the gap in Indigenous uh, life, out, um, life expectancy, by doing so we should actually just look at, it's an issue of disadvantage and that we can, we can make cost savings by looking at uh, the issue of disadvantage um, and so-called mainstreaming healthcare, Indigenous people through mainstream healthcare. So I guess I'm wanting to, to hear your opinion on that. Um, but also your thoughts on what a, a successful policy landscape would look like which uh, seeks to uh, close the gap um, in Indigenous healthcare. Thanks. Uh, we'll get you to come, but we'll get the next question, uh, which was over here. Um, and then we'll get the third one, and then we'll get everyone to comment on it. So. Thank you. Hi, Fiona Brook. I'm from the National Rural Health Alliance. Um, the last big reforms in health have come out of reports on the back of the Productivity Commission, which has done a significant analysis, including economic analysis. So I'm thinking mental health, NDIS, aged care, they've all gone through that process. How do we engage better with the economics side to really make our point that particularly addressing the social determinants of health has major cost and uh, savings and benefits for governments given it's well out into the 10 to 20 year cycle, not in the, the three year cycle that politicians think in if they think that far ahead. Thanks for that question. While we take the mic up there, I'll get, we'll, we'll deal with those two briefly if we can, only so we can get to the last sure. question. So Indigenous health, closing the gap and uh, the economic, the social benefits and economic yes. So I suppose what would, a, what would the policy landscape look like that is focused on closing the, the gap? Um, well, it's a policy landscape that thinks about uh, issues of racism. It's a policy landscape that thinks about issues of structural violence. It's a policy landscape that names uh, all of that as something that we would have to actually uh, address. It would be a policy landscape that says when we think about education, we can think about education, who benefits and who loses. When we think about urban planning, who benefits, who loses. Yeah, I could run through all of the different policy domains, but it's uh, just constantly thinking across these policy areas, who benefits, who loses, and how does this improve the health, uh, particularly of Indigenous Australians. Uh, and then if we do that, the thinking about the, the costing and the, the sort of the cost effectiveness uh, of that sort of uh, policy landscape uh, more broadly. I mean, there's some, been some lovely analysis that was done actually through Catholic Health Australia with colleagues in NatSim that said, you know, if you reduce health inequalities in Australia, it will save, and of course I can't remember all the numbers, but it will save this, this, this and this. I highly recommend have a look at it on the website uh, of Catholic Health Australia and NatSim if you haven't seen it at the University of Canberra. Um, and colleagues across the country are doing uh, some really uh, really nice uh, economic analysis of if you invest in traditionally non-health sectors, uh, what will this save uh, in terms of health costs, in particularly in areas like obesity, for example. There's quite a lot of work that I'm aware of that's happening in Australia around that. And that, of course, can be applied to a whole variety of, uh, of chronic uh, disease conditions. So there's work happening. Um, but it's in the, in the conversations of the sort that we're having here and in the reporting of this within, I come back to our media colleagues in the room, is making those connections constantly, using the demonstration of it's about a fair go uh, and it's about a, 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 an efficient uh, way forward as well. Thanks, Jan. Now we've got a question there and then a question down here. Hello, I'm Lauren Peach, interested bystander. Um, I guess we've talked a bit about uh, 
how difficult widespread reform will be and how important it is to make sure we're getting value for money from our system investing in the right places. Um, we've seen in the last 12 months the introduction of primary health networks. Um, I'm still sort of kind of grappling with what it is that they're going to be doing. Um, according to the health website, their key objectives are to increase the efficiency and... Ef is this working? Yeah. Oh, good. Sorry, it's very loud, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the efficiency and effectiveness of medical services and improving coordination of care. I guess um, I'm interested to know your thoughts on whether primary health networks will continue should Labor uh, be our new government and also maybe your thoughts on the how effectively the PHNs will come to uh, achieve their outcomes, their, their objectives, sorry. So we will address that. We'll just have a question. Um, so let's just make an assumption for the moment that each of you has the ear of a health spokesperson in a major party. What would be the one announceable you would put in the rear that you would want them to make? Because it's an announceables-driven election. So on both of those, we'll start with you, Art, and we'll go this way. I, I think I focus my uh, comments on access to the data. Yeah. <laughs> so give better access. Let us let us link it. Let us create that resource for scientists to hammer that data. You'll be amazed what we can do if, if there is a good, if, I mean, data that is out there is made available to us. I think we can do a lot. Uh, to put the COAG Reform Council back in place and to constitutionalize uh, with bipartisan or tripartisan support their role to think long-term about the healthcare system. And what do you think about the primary health care question? Uh, an interesting one. I'm somewhat optimistic um, that this comes after a long period of um, Medicare locals and, and drawing different sort of shapes on the map. I think it's important to think about the region as a critical uh, uh, somewhere between very local and the state level as a critical level at which you can deliver uh, and organize healthcare. And I think if as long as it doesn't tend isomorphically to a one-size-fits-all sort of policy, and that's the tendency in these sorts of things, if it allows some experimentation, it protects um, politically some different um, uh, PHNs to do things a bit differently and to learn adaptively from each other over a period of time, I think it could be, could be a good thing. Um, but if it gets politicized very quickly, becomes very short term, and there's just a standard way they deliver things, I don't think it'll make much difference. And Sharon, what's your announcement? Mine is, can I have two? Um, um, <laughs> okay, well, one won't cost anything. Um, so one would be, uh, we're going to establish, re-establish an Australian National Preventative Health Agency that focuses on people's uh, daily living conditions. We used to have a good one of those and then it was stopped. Uh, and the second announceable is that we, whoever the, the party is, we will make sure that every policy that we introduce uh, will one, do no harm, we will equity proof it, and we will health proof it. Now, in, uh, if it sorry. Two, I'm going to add one, another yep. one. <laughs> Fair enough. I think that's okay. So I think for priority disease and procedure areas, what those with highest burden, the gaps that will identify from that routine collected data that I talked about need to be filled in collaboration with docs, in collaboration with doctors, creating national data collection systems like registries. I think those two things in com combination of the data with data collected as part of delivery of care will be a really powerful resource for now, improvement. In, as in we are nearly out of time, I'm going to ask each of you, this is an election campaign. People have come along because they want to really hear your opinions. Can you, in just closing, one and a half, two minutes each maximum, Give a report card from your particular areas on how you think the government has done in your particular areas from your view and what things you have seen from the major parties that deal with some of the issues we've talked about. And we'll start with you, Adrian. Um, it, it doesn't matter that much which parties um, in power. I think they both... Uh, face and confront similar sorts of uh, challenges in, within the healthcare system. That's not always obvious during an election campaign where, where differences are emphasised, numbers are picked out and, and thrown at each other. But I think the dilemmas of uh, 
of uh, an, an aging population, rising medical care costs, serious and continuing illnesses, they will affect either whoever is the next Australian government. And I think that the extent to which we can, through elections and democratic participation, encourage a degree of bipartisanship on these things, it, I think would be a good thing for health policy. I don't think Westminster-style uh, government and opposition for health policy actually does health policy uh, much good at all. The other point I make is, internationally, the Australian healthcare system is, isn't too bad. It does, it, it's not always apparent during an election as people uh, complain about various things, but it actually does a pretty good job. And I think the question of what, what yes, there are, there are improvements that we've heard tonight that could be made, but I think it should be borne in mind also that it does a pretty good job. The report card, just very briefly. On the current government. On the current government. Um, uh, it has been less ambitious on the reform side and has not connected its fiscal decisions, and in particular its cuts, to a broader story of health system reform, and I think that's been a, a, a failure. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I want to give a, a report card on that. Yeah, I'm looking for a government uh, that is actually going to think about, uh, really think about fairness. Um, I suppose I'm quite disappointed in each of the parties' uh, narrow focus on health because it's about uh, treatment, it's not about prevention. Uh, it doesn't really speak at all, uh, I don't think, uh, about health. And I think that says a lot about each of our parties and the state of the psyche uh, at the moment as to how we will be moving forward in the future uh, to address some of the underlying causes of health inequities within the country. Uh, so my report card for each of them is uh, you can do an awful lot better if you want to think about a fair go for health. Have you seen any announcements in the weeks so far that have pleased you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't want to end the night uh, on a negative note at all because Adrian's point of actually in the grand scheme of things globally, the Australian health system, health care system actually does a fairly good job. But uh, is there anything that makes me feel encouraged that we're going to really address the systemic uh, social inequities that affect the health inequities in Australia? I would probably have to put my hand in my heart and say I don't think we're going for the sort of uh, transformative change that I think we would need to address those issues. It's a landmine for me. I've been here seven months. but uh, have you, you must have seen something. I've seen only... <laughs> I, I like that announcement of reference pricing and cutting back of medical device waste by Minister Lay in February this year has been announced. I, I think it's a, it's a good thinking and the right, move in the right direction. Just making sure we're not hindering innovation and we're encouraging um, evidence-based reference pricing, making sure that they're not different from quality and value for money perspective because often data is lacking. We're making assumptions that they're the same. They might not be. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure the audience tonight have really enjoyed hearing from you. It's an ongoing debate. Health is something that, as a society, we need to discuss more. And certainly, I've picked up a whole bunch of ideas that I'm going to be asking politicians about. And I'd encourage you to, too. Feel free to write to your politicians, email, ask them. I think the whole idea of more data from private health insurance is a really fascinating new idea that I've taken away. And it is just wonderful to hear such experts speak so passionately about their field. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. On Votes 2016.